Hi everyone, this is another episode of You Gotta Act, a podcast about actors and acting. I am Manuela Lazic, and today our guest is Jordan Beswick, acting coach, uh, talking to us from New York, I believe. Actually from North Carolina. North Carolina, all oh, right. Mm -hmm. So uh, Jordan, you chose to talk about the great uh, Montgomery Clift. But before we get into that, could you tell us a bit about uh, your journey with acting and acting coaching and all that? Absolutely. Um, I started, uh, you know, thinking about acting from a very, very, very early age. Didn't really do anything ex formally. Um, my studies were more or less informal. Um, then I started studying formally when I got into my teens and and uh but one thing led to another and uh i moved from uh the acting into agencies and management spent time doing that um which was an education and then i moved into casting from there which was also a really extraordinary education and then i moved from there into uh teaching and coaching and during all of that started writing and 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 directing you know things and so that's kind of where my my little journey you know in in relation mm -hmm. to uh uh the coaching and and thankfully because i had you know studied acting and pursued acting and done what i had done when i ultimately uh, found myself in casting um, agencies and management as well, but even more so in casting, um, I was sought out uh, a lot because of my knowledge and also because of my, my taste. Um, and so the casting, you know, was wonderful. Periodically, I still do it. I still consult. Um, but I just, I tell you, I'm, I don't know if anybody ever sets out to teach or coach. Mm -hmm. Um, but I have to say for myself that it's proven to be the most rewarding for me. Do you know, I just, I love it. So, so that's, that's mm -hmm. my journey. It's a beautiful story. Um, yeah, before we begin, I always wonder how people become casting directors because it seems like you don't go to school for that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's very, yeah, it's very interesting. Did you just kind of stumble upon that or... People notice yeah, you have good taste. Yes, everything everything that I've done subsequent to letting go of the pursuit of acting as a career has just basically fallen into my lap. It it it, it wasn't. I didn't ultimately choose any of the things that I've done subsequently. Um, with the agencies and management, uh, a friend of mine who I had I had acted with had stopped acting himself, and he had started. Um, a management company for actors. And at one point we were visiting and he said, uh, I, I kind of, I need a, an associate and would you be interested in being my associate? And I said, well, I'm not doing anything else right now. So I became his associate in the management situation. And that kind of kept me in the agencies and management for, for, for a chunk of time, a really nice chunk of time. And then I decided that uh, although I had enjoyed my time uh, in agencies and management, that it really wasn't something that I wanted to do because it's, it's, it's creative, but it's primarily business. And, and I really wanted to, to get back in, onto the creative side. And, and so I sent my uh, resume out to a lot of different places because I thought, you know, it would be nice maybe to be the associate or the assistant to an artistic director of a theater somewhere in New York. So I sent my resume out to all of the different artistic directors of theaters that I, I really respected. And I got a call from Doug Abel at the uh, Vineyard Theater in New York. And I went wow. down to interview with him and at the end of the interview, he said, well, you know, I'm not really looking for somebody to do what, what you're interested in doing. But besides being the artistic director of the theater here, I cast uh, independent films and I just picked one up. Would you want to be my assistant on it? So I said, sure, do you know, uh, why not? Uh, and so that, that started the whole casting situation. And, and again, it's, it's, it's wonderful because you're, all of the skills that you 
you you develop as as an actor you utilize i mean you you know i would go in and you know part of the whole casting process is to find actors who you genuinely believe are going to be able to do what's required of them for this specific project and oftentimes that really involves you know analyzing a script and breaking down the characters and i loved sitting with the directors of these projects or the writers and talking about their scripts with them and and whatnot and really brainstorming as to who would be the best um, actors in relation to who their characters were and what the stories were and you know all of this so mm. so that's it sounds like a really fulfilling job and it's so important I mean you know um, for instance, I mean, we can move to Monty soon, but uh, I know you, you did the casting direction on uh, Dead Man Walking. Well, I was the assistant on that. Yeah, that was the, right. yeah, I was Doug Abel's assistant on that. And, mm, and it was wonderful. I mean, what, what an extraordinary experience working on that film. I bet. Yeah. Um, it's funny because um, you, you chose to talk about Monty and I wonder when I see all these, um, for instance, an actor like him who was so groundbreaking, mm -hmm. if you were a casting director and you see someone like Montgomery Cliff, like at the time, I don't know if many people would have gone for him, <laughs> you know, because he was so different, mm -hmm. um, but he did make it. So what was the, what was the first film that you saw with uh, Mont Montgomery Cliff that, that left a mark on you? What was the first time you noticed him? Well, the very first time, uh, was uh, A Place in the Sun, mm -hmm. you know, because you, you have to remember that um, when I was young, um, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have, you couldn't rent movies. I mean, you, it was just, if, if it was all based on whatever was showing on TV, <laughs> do you know? Yeah. And in fact, it would be frustrating sometimes because once you uh, discovered a certain film or you discovered a certain actor or whatever, the best you could do is pour over the television guide every week in hopes of uh, discovering that they're showing a specific film or a specific actor that you're, that you're in love with. So the first one, uh, the first one was A Place in the Sun. And then of course, you know, everything was just like, okay, every chance I get to see anything that they might, you know, show on television. And books hadn't actually started, they, they didn't start writing books about him until I was like 16. Do you know, mm -hmm. I think it was 16 when, when I, did, I stumbled upon the, the first book that actually came out about him, which was Monty by uh, Robert LaGuardia. And, and, um, so, so I had to buy it, you know, I just had to mm -hmm. buy it and, and pour through it. But I, I do have to say that it's tough because, you know, the more I was more interested in learning about him as an actor and his process um, and, and studying his performances. I, I really didn't have this great desire to be like him personally. Right. Um, because he really didn't appear to be particularly happy. And, and which is not to suggest that he wasn't because there are a lot of people who say he actually was happier than a lot of these books would suggest that he was. But Indeed. I didn't really want to be like him, the person. I, I really, really just aspired to what it was that I found so extraordinary in his work. Mm -hmm. It's interesting you, you say that because that's always my, um, not problem, but that's always my, my point of friction with you know so much of the news outlets when they talk about actors they only talk about the gossipy aspect mm -hmm. and they don't really focus on the work which mm -hmm. for anyone who cares about acting that's that's the focus and it seems like especially for cliff there was a lot of noise around his performances and i actually read that this uh, la guardia book was i mean it's kind of held responsible for spreading a lot of myths about cliff being extremely unhappy because of his uh, sexual orientation because he was apparently bisexual but then I know that he's one of his nephews made a documentary about him yes. mm -hmm. um, kind of debunking all these stories and saying that you know he was actually very open about his uh, homosexuality and bisexuality but um, what made him very sad was the consequence of his uh, car accident 
and his pill addiction and all those things. So yes, it and just I, wasn't as attractive a story, I suppose. But exactly, you know. and I do have to say that it might very well be that that it wasn't so much the fact that he was what he was that contributed to his um, unhappiness, that it had more to do with the fact that he couldn't be open and honest about it, do you know? And Definitely. again, he, he may very well have been far more open about it with people who were really, really close to him. But it's hard to constantly live to an extent in fear that, you know, because you're discovered to be X, Y, Z, that it could conceivably kill your career, do you know? Mm. So, so I'm sure that that yeah. had to affect him. Um, but you know, he was, he was, he, 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 he was a mess though. I mean, he, he really did struggle enormously with, with drugs and alcohol and, mm -hmm. and but it even started, you know, it, it wasn't entirely because of the accident. Do you know? I mean, people were, were really, you know, showing concern, a lot of concern even before the accident, do you know? But, mm -hmm. um, but again, you know, I mean, if we're not careful, we have a tendency to focus too much on their personal lives. And what gets lost is, is the greatness of their work, do you know? the? Because exactly. for me, what I'm most uh, interested in is just you know, people who are able to achieve these things in performance. I mean, that to me is everything. And honestly, I think that when we, when we focus too much on their personal struggles and whatnot, it contributes to this myth that their, their genius came from their turmoil or their torture, as opposed to the fact that they were just really exceptional <laughs> actors, you know? Exactly. Who, do, and then, who know their job, yeah. you know? <laughs> and then I think this myth for the future generations who want to get into acting, they, I mean, I know that's a little bit true about myself, but, you know, we have kind of this idea of I'm not tragic enough. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm certainly not a genius because I don't have any tragedy in my life. Yeah. When actually, I do think from the training I've got in the Meisner technique, which is sort of related to, from, to the method acting, but obviously in a sort of lighter way, I do feel like actually being really healthy, mentally healthy, contributes to really oh, good acting in enormously. Most, for most people. Yes. Enormously. So. Do you know? I mean, uh, I'm sorry, but if, if, if you're tortured all the time, then sadly your characters are tortured all the time. And, 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 and one of the things that you really, one of the things that I appreciate so much about uh, uh, Cliff's work is that you see him play characters who aren't. You see him play characters who actually are, they're regular guys. They're, 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 uh, they're not sitting around, you know, like struggling and conflicted by demons. Yes, some of his characters are, but not all of his characters. And it's wonderful to see him play these guys who are so healthy, do you know? So mm -hmm. really genuinely healthy and, and super, you know, conscious and conscientious and dealing with things in ways where you're not sitting there thinking to yourself, this poor guy's gonna kill himself, do you know? No. So, so yeah. Yeah, that's what I was um, really struck by as well, is, is that he played a lot of people, a lot of characters that were ambiguous, but mm -hmm. verging towards health. So they were not, you know, good or bad. They were usually good guys that are, as you said, put in a situation, having to deal with it and, the situation kind of crawls over them and overwhelms them eventually. Yeah. But because I think it's because he had this very, he was very attractive, let's put it that way, but he also looked like a, a good person. Yes. And having that quality and his very realistic acting style, he could portray people who were kind of regular people mm -hmm. put in extraordinary situations and turning quite dark or turning quite, you know, murderous sometimes. And, yes. and that was a thing that I feel like at the time was, was quite new. Yes. And, and again, just like you said, he was playing, he was playing real people. I mean, he was really creating human beings. He wasn't just creating a type, you know, he wasn't just doing a style, if you will. And one of the things that has been, it's one of the things that, that 
helped me tremendously was not, again, not so much focusing on his personal struggles, but but to really be focusing in on the things that he, he would do in his approach to creating a, a character, which was he would just absolutely go through and dissect a script, you know? I mean, he really analyzed scripts, broke down scripts. He really, you know, because one of the things that I think is important is the whole concept of deconstruction, do you know? I mean, how better to to be prepared to construct a script by having first deconstructed it so that you start to get a sense as to what what's there so that you can then build, you know, construct exactly. it. And he was all about deconstructing and constructing. And also he was, his whole thing was about observing people. Yeah, exactly. I think, like you're saying, the idea of uh, deconstructing is is something that a lot of people, I think, when they think about acting, they don't see because obviously it's some kind of invisible work mm -hmm. that the actor is meant to do. But um, you actually sent me this clip of uh, Frank Sinatra mm -hmm. talking about how Monty would show up on set with the book of the film and the script and really working at figuring out what is the truest expression of the mm -hmm. character. And... Yeah, and like you say, deconstructing, it's it's interesting because when I when I did my acting training, um, we said the, it was two years, and the first year we said we always said it was about deconstructing yourself and your barriers and figuring out all your block blockages, mm -hmm. all your blocks, and it was extremely painful, <laughs> but it's this work that, like you say, first you deconstruct and then you can reconstruct anything with it. Yeah. So once we've taken down our blocks, we can then put them together in a different way and become another character. And I do feel like you're saying that Clift was extremely good at this. For for instance, like in Nuremberg, um, the mm. judgment on Nuremberg, he's, he's just completely his character and he's completely different from all the other characters he's played. Mm. Yes, very it's, much so. It's incredible. But that takes a lot of, and one of, and again, one of the things he was was uh, an, he really, really observed people, and you know, far too often we hear actors talking about the things that are similar. Do you know <laughs> things that 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 they say? These are all the ways I'm like the character, and for me, it's always been about the more important thing to focus on are the things that are different. Because, you know, I mean, I, your responsibility as the actor is to create all of those differences, you know, so that you really are creating someone who is not like you. I mean, this person is not you. And so, and that's what I loved about watching him as well. Um, and of course, that's when it does become interesting to learn a little bit about uh, them personally, because he was so not like you know a, a lot of his characters mm -hmm. he, just as a just as a person who was educated the way that he was the way he was raised you know um the education specifically that he received um and and yet he was called upon to play characters who were in total opposition to who he was raised to be and so he would make a study of people like the people he was meant to play so that it wasn't just about him showing up and being himself. I mean, he did the work, he did the work, you know, and it means you really do have to pay attention. You really do have to observe. You really do have to study, you know, other human beings so that when you're called mm -hmm. on to create somebody who's really nothing like yourself, you have points of reference. Exactly. And I think it's it's interesting you say that he he really liked to study people because that could sound like a kind of terrible way to treat people. Kind of like in um, Suddenly Last Summer, where it's all about this character, Sebastian, being a poet and using people. Mm -hmm. But I think what you're saying is that Clift could look at people and really consider them and really imagine being in, in their shoes. Mm -hmm. And that way, for instance... In A Place in the Sun, he plays someone who's not from a rich family. He's right. from a fairly working class. And he doesn't play that in a caricature way at all. He plays it with a lot of, I think, compassion and human understanding. You know, oh, he's, very much. he's just a person. When actually, uh, as you said, Clift was raised by, by his parents uh, in a sort of semi-aristocratic way. Mm -hmm. They really wanted him to have a really good education. 
and not at all to be a working class person. So, so yeah, that's the thing. Like he really treated his characters, I think, with a lot of compassion, which allowed him to be them. Absolutely. Absolutely. But he gave them thought. I mean, he really considered them. Um, I love it when Elizabeth Taylor talks about him and says that, for the first time, even though she'd been acting since she was five, you know, that for the first time, she was like, wow, um, this isn't a game. Do you know, this is, this is, this is something that you really have to invest in, yeah. you know, and, and that your, you, you have to, in, you, you, your gut has to be involved, you know, your gut has to be in an outrage. I mean, it, you have to be connected mentally, physically, and emotionally. You don't want it to kill you, you know, you, you, you want to, because I, I absolutely agree with her when it is that you no longer need all of those things that you've created that are affecting you the way that you are. Breathe, 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 and let it go. Do you know, find a way to let it go. And, and also find a way to let it go without having to resort to drugs and alcohol. Do you know? Exactly. That's the tricky part, I guess, for some <laughs> people, but yeah. But, um, yeah, like what you said just now about how you have to inhabit the character also physically. I thought that was extremely evident in that tiny scene he's got in Judgment at Nuremberg. Mm -hmm. Because he plays this character called Rudolf Peterson, mm -hmm. who's, um, I believe, a, a German man who during World War II was, um, what is it? Sterilized mm -hmm. by, by the Nazis. And it's one scene, but it's... When, when he first steps in, you already feel like there's someone completely different in mm -hmm. there. And in, this, in the scene, of course, we there's an ambiguity about the mental capabilities of the character, but that's, that is, um, that's not even, how can I say this? This is not about judging him. It's, it's about just a character who is like this, a mm -hmm. person who is like this. And actually the entire scene is about, you know, you shouldn't judge people just because they are different. Like they're different, they're not, as able as you and his entire behavior the way he moves the way he speaks as well his voice is different mm -hmm. and i th think he's trying to do a sort of german accent but it's not even about the accent it's about the tone and i was completely struck and i i, I watched just that scene and i cried so like, yeah. there was i yeah. don't think there's i don't think it's that easy to to uh, to become a character that deeply and the voice as well and actually we we did an episode with Denis Ménochet, mm -hmm. which I think you, you do teach, mm -hmm. and he put me in touch with you. And he said himself that the voice for him is something that he finds probably the hardest. Yeah. And it seems like Cliff had a handle on this. He did. You know, he would think about um, all of those things. But once again, he was thinking about it from the vantage point of creating a very specific person. And exactly. just like we were talking about before, even the characters of his who were could be considered tortured, um, could be considered to be uh, uh, having to deal with the weight of all of the things that they found themselves having to, the burden of the weight that they had to carry. You always saw him, I did anyway, you always saw him uh, creating a guy who was working not to be crushed, do you know? He was really working to 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 win. He wasn't he wasn't just you know wallowing, and and because that's okay. that's so much of the um, that can be problematic when you see people who are indulging their neuroses or they're indulging their their um you know all of this their their self torture and their self destruction and whatnot. I never saw him actively work to create characters who were just wallowing and indulging themselves. They were really working hard, you know, <laughs> to, 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 to not lose, you know, yeah. the fact that they yeah. lost was what made it so tragic because they were working so hard not to lose. Do you know? Mm. I think that's um, a temptation of acting sometimes is mm -hmm. just kind of getting to the tragic and just being there and staying there because in, in real life, we don't really get to access that place because in real life, we are trying to win. Yes. And and what he understood is that you have to translate that if you want to be realistic. If you want to really show people real life or, you know, a representation of it as true as possible, you have to show that people are not just 
su submitted to life. They, they live it. Yeah. And, and I think you're totally right. Um, even in I Confess, it could seem um, the Alfred Hitchcock movie where he plays a, a priest. It could seem that the priest is just taking it all on the chin and just, you know, just accepting his pain. But it's his stillness is his strength and he's trying to stay true to his vow. And and there's a lot of strength in that. Mm -hmm. And and it's some kind of quiet strength. And I think that's the the thing about this acting style, which is very natural, is mm -hmm. that it doesn't look like strength, like we typically see it in films. It doesn't look like, you know, for instance, in um, From Here to Eternity, you have Montgomery Clift and you have Burt Lancaster. <laughs> and Burt Lancaster is a bit more traditional in his oh, style. Sure. So when he's trying to win, he's like trying to win. Whereas Clift is just, you know, standing here. Mm -hmm. And it's and it's 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 interesting to see the clash of these of these acting styles. I think. Yes, and and what's interesting to me as well is that you see a clash of acting styles, but at the same time, you really do see different different um, different presentations of masculinity. Do you know? And and the thing that. One of the things that I love so much is when you actually have actors who really do understand how beneficial it is to um, to really create the feelings. I mean, really create the mentality, really create, you know, all of these things so that you are in fact actually being affected by all of these things. Because the more you're actually experiencing all of these things, the more subtle you can be, do you know? Um, because he was a very subtle actor. I mean, he was extremely mm. subtle. He wasn't showy, do you know? And and I think that was also a big, huge revolution, do you know? Because it's like, oh my gosh, this he just, he's there. And it's one of the things that both made him so appealing while simultaneously, I think, costing him awards because, because he appeared to be a part of the very fabric of the of the of the world in the piece. He didn't quote unquote stand out. Do you know? There's this one book that I read where, you know, the person was talking about um, having always been a big fan of his and having loved him, but oftentimes in her reminiscence, she would even kind of forget that he was in the film, do you know, because, <laughs> yeah. because he's just so, he's just so there. He, he doesn't, he doesn't force you to look at him. And, exactly. and, and almost because he's not forcing you to look at him, you can't stop looking at him, you know? <laughs> exactly. It's this kind of, um, chase her, pursue a relationship where he's always ev evading us. And that's why we're like, what is he doing? Who is this? But it's exactly true. I think I, I had exactly the same uh, reflection with my producer, Alessandro, as well, when we watched um, From Here to Eternity, mm -hmm. because that was the first one we watched for, for the preparation for this. I mean, I watched I Confess before, but that was the first one we watched together. And we were kind of like, yeah, I mean, he was in the film and he was really good but i don't know what to say he was just the character <laughs> and compared to bert lancaster like i said it's just um night and day in a way and yeah it's just um that it, it's it's revolutionary and what is also interesting is that before going to movies i think he did about 10 years of theater he yeah. was very established and it's interesting that even though not even though but maybe that's the wrong phrasing but he started in theater and he had a very subtle style Mm -hmm. And he brought that to the movies where it's more about close-ups and it worked really well there. But like you say, it looked like doing nothing. So it's very, but it's he like he can't very, win. Very, but see, that's the thing. I mean, when you, when you work to really build something, when you work to really construct something and it's really secure, then you're better able to trust it. You're in a better position to trust what you've really worked hard to create. And so you don't have to concern yourself in the moment with, you know, you're not working to show people what you've created. You just, you're just there as who you've created dealing with the situation. And the thing that I love so much is there's that moment in Place in the Sun, which I, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite, favorite moments ever is when all he's doing is 
thinking for the first time about killing Alice. All you do for a solid like 36 seconds or something is watch him just think and formulate those thoughts. And it's just so extraordinary because you know that his, his head is filled with those thoughts and, and, and you see it, you see it. You know, one of the things, there's an actor named Andy Griffith, <clears throat> who was very, very, very popular in the United States. Um, very different type of actor, but the first film that he did was a film with Eli Kazan called Facing the Crowd. <clears throat> and he said that, you know, Eli Kazan gave him the best acting advice that he ever got, which was, you know, if you, if you really think and feel what you're supposed to think and feel strong enough, then the camera will catch it, do you know? And that's what I always got with Clift, is that he really felt, he really thought what it was he was supposed to be thinking and feeling as, but as the people he was meant to be. You know, it's not just about you having a thought or a feeling as you, it's really about you having a thought or feeling as the person that you are in fact supposed to be. Because, you know, it, it's like listening with, you have a choice. You want to listen with your ears or do you want to listen with the ears of the person that you're supposed to be? There's a, I was just listening to um, a speech the other day. It wasn't a speech, it was a lecture um, by Michaela Cole. And she was talking about this book that she had read by Colin Wright called Act Accordingly. And she talks about a line that he has, which is there are as many perspectives as there are people. Mm -hmm. And it's so, so, so true. And one of the things that you really try to uh, instill in people is that whole idea that you're creating a person who potentially has a very different perspective than you do. And so it's important that you, you, you give some thought to that. You know? Definitely. I remember in my training, um, the first few scenes we were doing, um, I remember sometimes being completely not understanding my character. I was like, why would you do that? <laughs> and then you realize, oh, I need to put myself in her shoes and understand why she would do that. And we played with really intense things. For instance, oh, today, uh, Manuela, you're going to play a very racist person. And mm -hmm. it's like you when you if you do it right and if you really do it, you feel the feelings that a racist person confronted with someone of a different color, for instance, would feel. And it is and that's why I think that in some ways acting is a very humanitarian job because it makes <laughs> you really understand that people are different, people have different perspectives, they come from different stories. Everybody has a story, like we say, but that in the sense of everybody has a point of view. And like you say, yeah, it's it's um, just watching Montgomery Cliff think as this character in A Place in the Sun, who's a pretty regular guy. He's not the greatest. He's not clean. <laughs> he's not perfect. Yeah. But he wouldn't, he never thought of doing such a bad thing as killing someone. And it's the most, you're right, it's the most cinematic thing ever because no words just a person having thoughts and feel, feelings and and you know and it, it is it is revolutionary and I, like it's like you say you don't need to show people that you feel things mm -hmm. you need to feel them and the camera is treacherous so it does catch everything whether you like it or not it's true that's the beauty of it i used to tell people all the time that the camera is the most honest lover you'll ever have <laughs> yeah lover is one word for it i guess <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. So now that we've talked so much about how Clift was so good at his job and so um, determined and devoted, this has been called the method, method acting. Mm. I don't know if what he was doing was pure method. I think it, it was the early version, I suppose. But um, it was yeah. probably a variation I, on, I mean, because he did one of the things that he did was he ultimately found himself studying with Bobby Lewis, who had not long before had 
you know, come from the group theater. And remember, everything kind of from the group theater was born, the actor's studio and, you know, and all of these things. And so much of it has had to do with, you know, with Stanislavski and whatnot. But, but you know, Clift had already been, like you said, he'd already been acting in the theater for a long time. He'd already been, also, he, he, he also had exceptional taste. And he also, he, he was all about learning, learning and growing and developing and, you know, evolving and cultivating and all of these things. And, I mean, he would consciously choose to, to do uh, plays that he knew probably would not have any actual, you know, critical, you know, financial success or anything like that. But it was the opportunity to work with certain people. It was the opportunity to grow from the experience and to observe by working with, do you know? Um, so he wanted the to- The best kind of school. Yes, yes. You know, he wanted to work with Frederick March and Tulula Bankhead. He wanted to work with uh, Alan Azimova. He wanted to work with, you know, and, you know, the biggest probably um, inspiration for him ultimately proved to be an influence was probably Alfred Lund, do you know? And he, he studied these people, do you know? He, 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 he saw in them the actors, the artists that he himself aspired to be. And he, and he did, he, he, uh, but once again, what was so great about him, and he got, again, some assistance because he also worked with others who were also known, not necessarily to be excessively theatrical. Do you know, some of them mm -hmm. were actually working hard to create people as opposed to, you know. Just characters. Uh, yeah, just these, these, <laughs> these theater constructs. And, and so he did, he learned very well. Um, but yeah, so he worked with, with Bobby Lewis and I'm sure from that, and also it was interesting because he was, he's known as being a member of the actor's studio, but it wasn't someplace he ever actually spent time and do you know, didn't really mm. study there or work there. It doesn't right. mean that he might not have dropped in periodically, but honestly, I, I have a feeling that far more, actors even in the actor's studio were being influenced by him you mm. know than the other way around so so <laughs> and i've got I nothing see. against the method because you know when i was coming up i i i loved the idea of the method you know mm. i i loved being a part of even if um not entirely you know a part of it but i loved being there at the studio and I loved initially being a staff observer and getting to take classes with these people and get to go to the acting sessions and then ultimately when I did audition for it years later you know becoming a finalist for the length of time that I was until I finally just said you know what I because by the time I had act, I decided to audition for the actor studio um, and had become a finalist uh, I had stopped acting I, I was at that point I was I was teaching and I was I was uh, doing casting but it was interesting because once I started teaching at the Strasbourg Institute, which was right across the street from the vineyard where I was, you know, casting plays and, and, and films with Doug. Um, I don't know. I kind of was like, God, I haven't really acted in a long time. So I want to see whether or not I can still do myself what it is I'm teaching other people to do. So I thought, you know what, I'll just go audition for the actor studio because anyone can. And you know, I got a final and, and the whole business. So I thought, okay, I can still do it myself. So, so I feel more secure. I feel more comfortable because when I was a young person studying, I wanted to know that the people that I was studying with could do what they were teaching me. And again, there are some people in the world who they're exceptional teachers. They can't do it themselves, but they're really good at helping other people to achieve their right. best. But for me personally, I wanted to know that the people I was studying with could do it themselves and, and not just do it themselves, but do it really, really. You know? <laughs> that makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah. In fact, one of the people that I studied with when I went to New York was Mira Rostova, who was Montgomery Cliff's coach. Yes. When I found yes. out oh, wow. she lived there. When I found out that she was still teaching, I was like, Oh my gosh, I have to, I have to. So that was a really, really great experience as well. 
Mm. Did you see in her teachings, like reflections of Cliff? Like, did you see that it made sense that she had been his coach? Yes, and and, and it, it was interesting though because I saw, I saw or experienced what I imagined she would do with him when she worked with me. I didn't really see it too terribly much when she worked with a lot of the others because by that time she was very old. And so she, I don't think she had the same degree of patience that she used to have. So she would more or less give line readings to people, which right. I find to be horrible. You know, I don't think that anyone should just give someone a line reading and say, this is the way the line should be said, you know, now repeat after me. And, and so she would, give line readings and that initially put me off. But when I actually got up there to do my monologue, and this is the way she ultimately worked with me throughout the entire time that I worked with her, is that she would turn my monologues into dialogues. Right. So that we would end up having conversations with my monologues. She would, she would literally second guess everything and was always right where uh, she needed to be so that we would have this really engaged um, uh, conversation. And it completely broke me of the whole concept of monologuing. It, it, it really reinforced to me that all you're doing is having a conversation where you're just doing all the talking, do you know? Mm -hmm. um, but you should never assume that, that you're not going to be interrupted, do you know? I mean, and you should always take into consideration that you're sharing something for the purpose of the other person understanding something, or at least making yourself understood, but not doing a monologue, do you know, but really, mm. really having a conversation. And so she mm. was unbelievable at helping me. And I, in that respect, I was like, oh, this is really great because I really imagine her doing this with him, do you know, just sitting there, sitting there, sitting there, so that it's completely stripped of artifice, completely stripped of acting, if you will. Mm. It's, in, it's interesting. I remember when we did monologues, it was some of the most painful <laughs> moments because it, it just feels silly because when you think monologue, like you said, you think, oh, I'm talking to myself. But that is obviously not what, what we're taught. Um, my teacher was very clear. You are talking to someone, mm -hmm. trying to see who it is you're talking to and really tell them, really tell them every line because they are they might not even want to hear you. So imagine a person who's not even there to hear you and you want to tell them something. That was the idea. And that, that really changes your perspective. But Absolutely. yeah, that's fascinating. Absolutely. And also doing everything in your power to really create the person who is even potentially reacting and responding non-verbally to what you're saying, because that affects us too when we're having a come when we're sharing something with somebody it can change entirely the way that we proceed just on the basis of a breath that they take or a look that they give, do you know? So, so it's, it's very important to use that imagination to create. And that's what I just always believed that he was doing while dealing with who it was that was standing in front of him. I, I think that he was one of those actors who came to the set really prepared, but dealt with what he was presented with, do you know? I mean, because you don't want to just simply play what you've prepared, you know, because right. then you're shutting out the world. It's like you want to prepare yourself to be whoever it is you're supposed to be and then deal with what it is that you receive from the others. And, and, uh, and that's what I always felt that he really did. There's a moment when uh, when he's about to, in Place in the Sun, when he's about to to leave to potentially escape because the police have come to the to the vicar's country place and and there's that moment when he hugs her and it's literally you're watching him and it's like he's burrowing into her do you know i mean literally he's holding her in such a way that it it's it's the it's the entirety of himself and that's what i loved so much about him um was that he really, he didn't just understand things intellectually. He took what he understood intellectually and he turned it into a human, a human being, do you know? Yeah, definitely. And I feel like he, in particular with Elizabeth Taylor, I think because they were so close, he really, there was a feeling of he could kind of let that happen a lot more, but that's another story. I think she was very receptive to that in a way. She was very, very receptive. But also it's just, it, I tell you what always boggles my mind when I watch that movie 
is that, you know, he was like 30, 30, 31, and she was 17. Do you know? I know. And it's, it's mad. just unbelievable. It's just unbelievable. Um, when I watch her, and you do see a difference. You do see a difference in her in that film than you did from what she had done before. And there were so many actors who had been working forever, do you know, who upon working with him would say similar things that she said. I remember this one who said, you know, it was the first time that when I looked into the, into the eyes of the person I was standing opposite, I really found myself looking into the eyes of the person I was supposed to be looking into those eyes. But in the story, in the story, and, and, and I had a choice to make. Do I either join him in that world or do I just act with him? And okay. they chose so oftentimes, thankfully, to join him. So, so you know, it, 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 and it, makes, it makes a difference. Hmm. It certainly does. All right. Well, I think we've covered a lot about Clift. Such a short career, but such a love, so much to talk about <laughs> and such achievements. Um, thank you so much for your time and your amazing insight. I mean, so many times when you were saying some sentences, I could see my producer, Alessandro, just being like, yes. <laughs> so I think <laughs> you've really nailed it many times. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate the... Uh the invitation and the opportunity. You're so welcome. Thank you. Thanks for listening to or watching this episode of You Gonna Act. Support us and find special episodes and more on Patreon at patreon.com slash you gotta act. Follow us on social media and let us know what you think. See you next time. <laughs>